There we go. Hello. This presentation about growing Vera's gardens is being given by Elizabeth Wallace. Elizabeth is our chapter's expert on landscaping and homeowner associations. She has experience with homeowner boards, management companies, fire authority requirements, landscape maintenance companies, landscapes that meld into the wildland edge, and of course, the use and preservation of native plants. So how was this useful at Vera's? Well, the team project became owners of five buildings and many acres of land because of a generous donation. The teen project knew what to do to bring the human beneficial elements to that sanctuary. But the acres of neglected, weedy land surrounding the, surrounding the houses was beyond what they had time and knowledge to repair. Their first thought was to lay lots of artificial turf. And this is the point in the story where our hero walks onto the land and into the story. So, Elizabeth, it's all yours. All right, thank you, Brad. All right, I'm gonna go ahead and jump into screen sharing. Just a moment here. Okay, and now we can, we can get started with the presentation. Um, Brad gave a great introduction. Um, this is about creating a garden sanctuary for women who've been trafficked into human trafficking and homelessness. So um, this is a rehabilitation project of 12 acres in Tribuco Canyon. And I want to get started, but before I do, I'll just let you know this is a little woodland skipper, a local butterfly on a local native plant called a golden bush. Here's an overview of Vera's gardens. This was formerly owned by Boys Town. Boys Town built these five homes 30 years ago. And what they were doing was sheltering troubled teens. So Boys Town's run by a Catholic charity. And they, the cul-de-sac is named Flanagan Drive that you see here. They built these homes for, they would help um, troubled teens go to school and get jobs and keep them safe and sheltered in the meantime. Well, in 2016, Boys Town decided to sell the property. They owned a total of 50 acres and a developer bought it. They bought, he bought all the 50 acres, but he didn't want these homes um, that were a part of this 50 acres. So he offered the five homes you see here, plus 12 acres of land, to any nonprofit who could raise a million dollars. And uh, in the next slide, you see the, a nonprofit called the Teen Project was able to raise this money and buy the homes for their, um, what they do is they shelter women who've been subject to human trafficking and homelessness. This is Lori Burns. She's on the property. This is a photo from the newspaper article that I read on Christmas Eve in 2018. And I was interested because I live near this site and I, I was interested to learn that Boys Town had left the site and now this, this new nonprofit had taken over this. So Lori Burns is gonna, she has um, a 70 bed home to help women in LA. She has two homes in Orange County. This would be another one of her properties where she shelters women. So when I read about it in the newspaper, I, I was reading toward the end of the article and Lori was looking for donations of artificial turf. She had a lot of, of barren ground to take care of and she had a lot of work to do to get ready to, to house women here. But when I saw that, I thought, oh, I don't want artificial turf in Tribuco Canyon. We're talking just above Rose Cantita, if you know uh, where that is. It's on a high ridge top. So I cold emailed Lori and I asked, I told her congratulations on getting the site and I offered to help her with the landscape. And she said, yes. So this is what we saw three days later, I was on the site with my husband, Jeff, and Brad Jenkins, who's the president of the Orange County chapter of the CNPS. The homes had been vandalized because the property was for sale for a couple of years. 
Lori had her hands full. She was busy uh, trying to rehabilitate the homes to make them safe. And she was also working on getting licensing to house the women. You can see how barren the front yards are. This is another view. This is a different house. It's called House One. It's the first house you see when you drive up Flanagan Road. In the background, you see Brad Jenkins is standing. We are overlooking what I'd gotten us into. We're discussing whether we could even do it. I was, I'm holding a tract map. And what you see here is invasive fountain grass. And um, we also learned that the sprinkler system wasn't working and the soil was compacted. And there were many problems to overcome. Just the sheer size of the project made us pause. This is what we were looking at in this house one landscape. It was fountain grass. It's invasive. I, I think Boys Town probably planted it, but then it spread. It spread. It was growing in the cracks of the street. It was spread all the way into the canyon. It's, it isn't fire safe or attractive. And we knew that if we took this on, that we before we could even plant our plants, we'd have to remove all the invasives. And here, here are three of my, as Brad and uh, a couple other volunteers, knee deep in fountain grass. We decided to go ahead. And what we promised Lori was this promise, that we would do this project in phases because the project was so large. We would start small, uh, and plant three front lawns on the west side of the project. These were the smaller lawns. And so this is exactly a month after I emailed Lori. I ordered 300 plants from a local nursery and we hoed this lawn you see here it was infested with mustard. We hoed it for two days. Then I called for volunteers to help plant. And you see in the background, we have a couple of volunteers from CNPS, Daniel Donovan and Cyril Hamish. And they actually got this lawn, this first nice hillside lawn planted in one day. And that was a relief. Here I am, this is the second house. It is the main house. And the, the remaining lawns were flat like this, very compacted and riddled with tree roots. My vision as a designer was to fill the lawn with soft yarrows and beautiful low native plants, but I couldn't uh, overcome the, the tree roots. These are, this is a valley oak with very shallow roots. You see them running all through the lawn. I had to reduce how many plants I was able to install. And then it was so tough. I couldn't dig a hole with a shovel. I, you see the pickaxe in front of me. We use the pickaxes to dig the holes on these two. Two of the lawns are like this, very flat and compacted. I wasn't sure, I lost some sleep. I wasn't sure whether the plants would even grow in, under these conditions. But that year we did have some wonderful rains and I think that helped a lot because here it is two spring times later, this is the same lawn, this is Lewis, he's the treasurer for our local California Native Plant Society chapter. He's helping me weed. He, Lewis is one of my volunteers. But this is the northern part of the same lawn that you saw me um, installing the purple sage. You see that these white sages have made it. They, ha they are established and they're looking beautiful. And so the California fuchsia and deer grass and goldenrod and even manzanitas are doing well. This is a compacted red clay soil, but it seems whatever we're doing, it is working. So here's a before shot of the fountain grass at house one. Here is an after shot, the very same yard. We're looking down the street and you can see Ancelia is growing and healthy. White sage is trying to get started, California fuchsia, golden bush, there's baccarus in the background and buckwheat. This is already, this uh, hillside is more beautiful and fire safe. It's really healthy for the pollinators and the wildlife as well. 
we were able to complete phase one with it. It took us four months to plant those 300 plants. That is a long time, but um, the soil was so hard it, and there was so much weeds that that's why it took us all spring uh, until spring to get all the plants in. This is house one again. You see, we did broadcast poppy seeds are growing. There's sunflowers, white sage, and manzanita in this photo. I was proud of us that we were able to get those 300 plants in. And um, also the teen project said, yes, this is working. Let's continue. They said, let's go on to phase two. And so here is where we started with phase two. This is a 5,500 square foot piece of land that's kind of a focal point at Vera's sanctuary. Um, it's, it's, it's all on its own between two driveways, very compacted soil, again, run through with mustard and ice plant. At this stage, I, because I, we had to water every plant by hand, um, I just couldn't bear the thought of turning up this compacted soil with a pickaxe and a shovel by hand. I knew I needed help. So I reached out to Tree of Life Nursery to see if they would help us landscape this portion. And they said, yes. And this is the concept plan that Tree of Life created. Randy Gunner is the designer. She created a lovely, plan with a DG pathway that winds through the entire site. There's a central seating area for the girls to meet and raised planters and beautiful native plants. So in January 2020, exactly one year after we started phase one, we broke ground for phase two. And to my great relief, Tree of Life brought a terrific contractor in. His name's Gilbert Bresenio. And he came with his bobcat. So you can see uh, what was compacted uh, barren landscape is already been graded and boulders have come in. It was such a relief to have someone with some uh, heavy equipment to help us continue to developing this site. This is eight months later. By now, Tree of Life has left the project. They were back in, in their nursery. And I was working as the project manager with Gilbert, our contractor. We are standing at the back of the butterfly garden and we're looking toward the street. So we're overlooking three raised planters and a beautiful central seating area. You can see Gilbert, the contractor, is in the middle, of standing by the car in the background. The cook for Vera's Gardens is standing next to him. In the front, though, one of the most beautiful design features of this butterfly garden is the willow archway hoop, an entryway that marks the entryway. It, it's just elegant and lovely. We waited until October to plant and I asked Jonathan Frank, he, he's a botanist and he knows native plants through and through. I asked him to help me pick out my plant palette. And I'm really grateful I did because he encouraged me to pick plants that I might not have chosen. I might've picked a more conservative palette. So thanks to Jonathan, this garden is so beautiful. Uh, he also helped me set the plants in the perfect location in the butterfly garden. So here it is, <laughs> doesn't look like much yet. We have the plants set out and ready to plant. But five months later, here's this garden. This garden was amazing. It established really quickly. And I think part of the reason is because we brought in truckloads of soil they were free. It was free soil because it is soil when people excavate their swimming pools. So they, they're looking to get rid of it. So we, we brought in several truckloads of that. So we had this beautiful raised planters and native plants love to grow in a raised planter. So here we are looking through the willow archway hoop. We planted uh, Anacapa pink morning glory on the willow archway. In the foreground, you see Verbena della Mina flowering, also a sage called Dara's Choice. 
there's penstemon spectabilis and an artemisia and poppies growing in the background. And you see how beautiful the DG pathway is winding through the gardens. We, we have built DG pathways throughout the entire site and it's lovely. Here's another view. In the foreground is Penstemon spectabilis and its cousin, the Margarita Bop Penstemon. The DG pathway winds back toward those raised planters we saw earlier. We planted Mexican elderberry in the raised planters. Those are a very popular bird um, plant. And so in the middle, we put a three-tiered fountain. The wildlife love this fountain. Oh. We, we have to fill it with water every day. It is so well used. And you can see poppies and ashy leaf buck ground, buckwheat growing in the background as well. This is the last uh, spring slide I want to show you. It's dramatic, the butterfly garden again. Um, seaside daisy is growing in the foreground and that penstemon spectabilis again. But what I wanted to mention, one of the delights of this site where are the trees? Thankfully, uh, Father Flanagan's Boys Town planted some gorgeous coast live oaks that are native to the area. And also uh, Tory pines and also valley oaks. So it helps this project because they add structure and beauty. And I'm thankful that there were no palm trees on this site. Although there are some peppers which are not native. But overall, a very good tree palette on the site. It helps in, in the design. Wildlife, as I mentioned before, loves the fountain. This is an oak titmouse. There are always birds on this fountain during the day and probably raccoons and deer and foxes drinking out of it at night. It's a lovely spot. Also as part of this phase two, we completed backyards. Uh, the backyards look like this in the winter. Every backyard was like this, muddy with terrible drainage. This is the children's house, which is licensed especially for women who might come in that are pregnant or have young children. This is how that same backyard looked in the springtime. The weeds were waist high and the playground was filled, was lined with weed cloth and filled with rubber tire mulch. So we had to get rid of the mulch uh, to make it safe for the children. We took the mulch out and we installed a, a clean playground sand. This is the same yard again. We put in pavers along the house. We built a, a large native plant planter and an apple tree, installed an apple tree for the kids. And then we seeded grass. We seeded Marathon One. It was, it's an expensive and this is a shady lawn, so it doesn't take much water. And because the kids are always using it, we thought this was an appropriate lawn for some grass. So now we're moving to phase three. This is, if you look at the date, this was one month ago. The Gilbert, the contractor, came back with his bobcat and he said, Elizabeth, if you draw this, I'll build it. Now, this avian garden is different than the butterfly garden because it's not isolated within driveways. This garden connects two large front lawns. So now we're on the east side of the property. And I had to uh, find a way to integrate the lawns with the garden. And after having worked there for a couple of years, I watched how the residents use the site and I came up with this concept plan. We're again, I'm reducing our irrigated areas by putting in large DG pathways and a large DG meeting space. We have another fountain, of course, because this is an avian garden. And we have raised planters for natives and I wanted to add more more oak trees to cool off the area. When Gilbert came in, the contractor, with, and he dug up the earth, I smelled the earth that was under that crust of crete weed and mustard that had just barren for years, and I felt filled with hope. So here we are less than a, a month later, the DG pathways are in, 
the planters are almost ready to plant. We drop some boulders. And just last week, we planted 140 native plants in the avian garden. We're not finished yet. We'll be planting more tomorrow. This is uh, one of my volunteers. This is a favorite of my planters because it, it has an Engelman oak and a, a coast live oak as well. It's a um, very useful, beautiful site already. The residents are using it focal point on the mature oaks. You can see the mountains in the background. I wanna to talk just briefly then about our invasive plant management. In the background of this photo, you see the house. That was the house riddled with fountain grass. Well, now where the, these volunteers are standing, it's by the entry gate. A teen project installed a gate to protect the women of Vera's. And this whole area is filled with thousands of sea lavender or status. I, um, the first few, the first year we filled four semi-truck loads worth of invasive plants. But by this time, all I had was a green waste can. And I was consulting with Ron Vanderhoff to help me prioritize uh, how, when to remove the invasives. And he said, you gotta get these out, gotta get the status out. So this is how it looked. We spent a couple days uprooting status. And this is just a small mountain. <laughs> There's another mountain on the other side of the street and there are still a lot of status left, but we were able to chip this and use it as mulch. Uh, we spread it as mulch down in the wildland. It is a, um, some of the seeding, but we are removing the seedlings very easily. This is what status does and, and all the invasives. I've seen uh, ice plant as well. They crawl over, they grow over the top. This is a native chaparral yucca that the status is. It's holding down, it's keeping the yucca from thriving. So it does feel very good to remove invasives. And I wanna just briefly talk about the Bradley method. <clears throat> when I first started at Vera's, I didn't, I never heard of the Bradley method. Uh, Chuck Wright was one of our early volunteers and he and Brad Jenkins told me about this method of removing invasives. It was started by the Bradley sisters of Australia. One of the sisters was a scientist and they would walk their dog through a park in, in where they lived and they would just remove invasives as they had time when they walked their dog. And what they noticed was that the native plants were returning, that they realized that you don't have to bulldoze a site to help native plants. You can just remove uh, invasives as you have time and that the, the soil has the native seeds inside. And, and here you see uh, goldenrod just growing like crazy. I have goldenrod and golden bush and the, the plants you see listed here are resurging on the site on the wildland hills. And this is Lewis again, he's watering. Behind him is our one of our walnut trees. We did plant a few uh, black sage and other appropriate plants. So we water those um, and help along these new natives through the hot summer. I want to briefly also talk about the people of Vera's. I work with the residents. These are a few residents. I need to protect their privacy. So this is the only slide you'll see of the people, but um, I work with them every Monday morning and I teach group and they learn about gardening, horticulture, and we learn about the plants and the animals that live in this wildland area. So. One of the things we do is broadcast poppy and lupin seeds. So I've given them, they have in their hands uh, these seeds and they're out on the wildland hillside. This is the same hillside that I just showed with Lewis uh, water on in the front of. And here you can see, also see in this, in the foreground is, are the invasive uh, cystus that we've mostly removed from this hillside. But the, the residents love broadcasting poppy seeds. They love poppies growing the flowers on, their, on the property. We also build things together. This oak tree was 
the, it was infested with ice plant underneath. So we removed the ice plant and together, or I would say the residents mostly built this by themselves. This is a dry river memorial for the past and future residents. We built it out of cobbles and the residents enjoy painting inspirational messages on the cobbles, messages of hope and peace and love. Another thing we do together is we plant a garden. A volunteer that built four raised planters, a, a beautiful garden. So these women do not, most of them have no experience gardening. Um, so I try to make it as fun and easy for them as I can. I bring in flowers and vegetables and seeds. I bring tools and I bring them gloves. And I tell the girls just to pick one flower or one packet of seeds. And we walk over to the garden together. And this is the garden after we, we just planted it. This was our summer garden. And one of the residents said to me afterwards, she said, I was scared that it was gonna be hard, but it was so easy. And that's because we all work together. And I made sure that I teach them how to take the plant out of the container, how to set it into the soil, how deep to set a seed. And we water, we water the plants. This is a thriving garden. You can see the volunteer did a great job building it. He put a deer fence around it and it has a view of the ocean and Robinson Ranch is on the left. You see, it looks like there's a sprinkler system, but it doesn't work. We do hand water and care for these plants by hand and harvest them as well. So just in conclusion, um, I've been on the site almost three years now. This is a photo of narrow leaf milkweed with monarch butterflies, uh, caterpillars, excuse me, just munching away. The, the wildlife has returned. You can see a list of just some of the wildlife that we've been able to enjoy on this site. But I also want to just say that this began as it, I wanted to prevent plastic going down in the canyon, to prevent artificial turf. And it became so much more as we, I built relationships with my volunteers and with, um, with the people of Vera's. And so while the women are healing, they can look at, out their window and see the land healing as well. This is my last slide. This is just a few of my volunteers. And if you have any questions, you can always email me. My email is shown there at the bottom. Uh, the Teen Project is the name of this nonprofit that's helping the women. If you want to help the women, you go to theteenproject.com. You can see all the amazing things they do. And the last thing I want to point out is we are standing down by the entry gate where we planted four oaks. You can see them behind my husband and Brad. And also I'm just proud of the dirt <laughs> that you see here because that was covered with ice plant and cystus and swamp salt bush and sea lavender. And now it's free and ready for natives to seed and grow again. And that is the end of my presentation. Thank you, Elizabeth, for sharing Vera's garden story with us. You're welcome. For you viewers, this story was presented at our October 21st, um, October 2021 chapter meeting. We hope to see you at future presentations. You can always see upcoming events at our website at occnps.org. One more time, that is occnps.org. So give a thanks later on, I guess, to Elizabeth. And so long for this time. Bye.